it's Tell Me How You're Mighty, Infidelity Survival Stories. I'm your host, Tracy Shorn, otherwise known as Chump Lady, and I'm here with my co-host, Sarah Gorl. And today we're talking with trauma specialist, Diane Strickland. You may have noticed her trenchant commentary at the Chump Lady blog or on social media. Diane is a certified community and workplace traumatologist. She's a compassion fatigue specialist and a critical incident responder. And she's also an ordained clergy person. She's done ground support after Canada's two largest natural disasters. And she's a trauma survivor herself who started her website, Your Story is Safe Here, to serve wives and partners traumatized by men called, air quotes, sex addicts. And during the pandemic, Diane also wrote the first trauma-informed ministry primary in Canada. Welcome, Diane. Oh, good to be here. Yeah, well, I, I thought we'd get right into the trauma discussion. Um, you're a former chump, and if I understand you, you're also a trauma professional. Can you tell me how those two things, um, were you a chump first and then became a trauma specialist, or you dealt in trauma and then, oh my gosh, now you've got handed a plate of it it's most <clears throat> mostly the latter um i was in ministry of an ordained for 30 years and and ministry is tra- is marinating in trauma like people are have all kinds of it and they're bringing it every week in one form or another but none of us were trained for it and so mm-hmm. when when this experience happened to me and i knew that there was something seriously wrong with me and I was assessed for PT, PTSD, CPTSD. And I began to think, I don't know anything about this. So in typical me fashion, I read everything I could get. And I researched everything I could get and was sort of putting in the, that's stupid and this is not stupid categories. And, and then I began to take a lot of courses in mm-hmm. it. Finally, one place that was... I was taking courses funds wrote the the woman who runs it wrote me and said, Diane, will you please take a certification because you obviously know something about this. So I began doing that as well. And uh, it it sort of reoriented my work quite a bit. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the whole trauma thing, sort of being immersed in this world of trauma, quite often it's trauma that isn't caused by individuals I think the difference is with the the sort of people that we're talking about is when you've got when you've got one person who seems so intent on destroying somebody else's life it's it's more of a deliberate act rather than external forces that are beyond anybody's control well I I work in natural disasters which are beyond our control but I've worked in unnatural disasters where things are in our control and it's just very different, difficult sometimes to change them. One of the things about your work that I, I found interesting at your story is safe here is that you're very vocal about taking on the sex, uh, sex addiction. I don't what are we going to call it industry? (laughs) It seems to be a whole therapy model about sex addiction. And from what I understand you're saying is that we've got to drop this whole codependency language um, and that instead of telling women that, and it's generally women, can be men too, that they drove their partners to be sex addicts, that instead we should look at them as abusive individuals that inflicted trauma on an innocent, unknowing person. It just seems that's what it is at the face of it. I, I don't understand why there's a therapy model that doesn't see that. Can you... Could you discuss that? Could you discuss your work a bit? Well, yeah, I I didn't start this, uh, but I I certainly challenged it very early on, and and was uh, thinking there's this is uh, this is wrong. The person who really did the the research on the codependent thing is uh, Dr. Barbara Steffens, and her PhD was all about this. And she's the one in two thousand and nine who who her uh, she got her PhD based on the research that showed that um, women who were being called codependent actually met the criteria that they were traumatized. And she, if her book lays that out, and, and in fact, 70% of the women she studied, nearly 70%, um, met the full criteria for CPTSD or PTSD. Now, that's pretty significant. That's amazing, yeah. Yeah, that's huge. And so... 
when they weren't being treated for it in the industry, obviously, they were being treated for this other hybrid thing that was invented in, you know, the latter part of the century, the second half of the last century, and mainly used to target women, to call them something. And it's a, it was really a form of gaslighting and blame shifting to I, say, I, that. yeah. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And of course, I got very angry about that. And along with a lot of other people, you know, that was a moment of, of, oh my goodness, this whole thing stinks like a rotten fish. And that's where, where I sort of left that whole train and got on this other one. Yeah. That, that's your mightiness right there. That is. <laughs> I, I wasn't af afraid of, the, of uh, saying, you know, when pigs fly. I'm fine. <laughs> we're, we're, that, uh, Sarah, that, that narrative is still so strong, isn't, isn't it? Is it? Still, there are an increasing number of voices like yours saying, hang on a minute, this is a load of old nonsense. But still largely, there's a there's a louder voice that says, you know, that this is this is the, the thing to believe. Well, a whole lot of us took on the industry and we we saturated every form we could with a really uh rational explanation of why this was nonsense and i i was one of the first voices uh, that publicly called these relationships abusive good for you and and i took an awful lot of heat for that because i was of course angry yeah well you can't be an angry woman now, I'm curious if either of you have been called codependent in therapy because when i went to therapy with my abuser a man who literally threatened to kill me, hunt me down and burn my house down, in addition to being a serial cheater, I was told that I was exquisitely codependent. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, not, not just codependent. I'm an overachiever. They always, they almost I was exquisitely sound... codependent. So, so just uh, that, that almost sounds like a compliment if you if you throw in the word exquisite into proceeding. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, there are certain parts of it I, I bought, you know, and I even wrote about it in my book, which was that I was, fair enough, I was owning things that were not mine to own. I, I felt that, you know, I was responsible for his mood, for his behavior, but I see a lot of that now through the lens of, I was trying to control the uncontrollable. I was trying to control this raging rhinoceros of a chaos, this terrible man. Um, and yes, I mean, from whatever my own issues or my own magical beliefs and my powers of rationality or something I thought I could control that and it was very freeing to let it go but I didn't I don't think I needed to be called an exquisite codependent I mean did either of you get kind of called out as, as a codependent I think I diagnosed myself I didn't have time for any sort of therapy I was just literally left my my husband disappeared into the ether he did all the stuff of trying to come back and and keep us both going but I had four children and a job to manage the youngest mm. child was two so I the only time I had was in the middle of the night to do the diagnosis myself and I did actually diagnose myself as as codependent during that time when I was doing all the other stuff that you're advised to do trot around and and oh, blame God. yourself and and uh, uh, find excuses for their shocking behavior and look to what you've done to make them behave in this this abysmal way so I did the lot yeah but it was all of my own back basically oh, God. What I found online until I discovered your site <laughs> oh well, how about you Diane are you are you an exquisite codependent too are you oh, part of the club <laughs> I was certainly called that by my ex-husband's therapist mm -hmm. who ordered it to me of course but yeah, I, I think what we need to to know is that this has been backed off by the industry, the the uh, at least the sex addiction treatment industry, because of course women cottoned on to it, and that ruined business. And so oh. there was enough conversation about it, but that it didn't mean they then um, called in all of the people they'd certified in models that was were designed to tell people they were codependent. Um, they didn't do that. They just sort of softened the edges of it. You are telling me they didn't issue an apology? Oh, oh no, no, no. And and I don't want the one from them because it means nothing. But what I want is for for therapists to stop doing it, mm -hmm. and they still do it. They still do it. They love it, and and it's a really insidious kind of thing because so we're at the same time as we're 
being told we're codependent in the industry, we're, we're advised to do codependent things, like take on uh, responsibilities for checking in with them and making sure they're not being uh, sex addiction activities and stuff. Like that's, I'm not, that whole, being the hall monitor is, is a part of being codependent. So I my, my whole um, upset about that was that if if you didn't go in as a codependent, you came out as one from from that whole mm -hmm. program. You were asked actually to be codependent, to dial down all your alarm systems that were telling you something's wrong, like anger. Yes. Like that's part of your alarm system. And that's one of the mighty things is that when you were able to finally understand that your your anger, if it is in fact based on something that's true is entirely rational and a sign of your sanity. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And I, I, I signed up for some advice, which sent me a, a daily email on how to save my marriage. And a lot of that was stuff like make sure you're beautifully presented, put makeup on. If he's behaving in a suspicious way, don't question, just, just, just let it ride, let him get on with it. And oh it almost, it, it almost encourages you, as you say, to be codependent and to go down this, 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 you know, further down an abusive line. So all the time you're trying to save your relationship, you're shutting off your alarm system that's there to protect you and your children. Yeah. And, and it's being turned off and, and anger can be a very damaging thing, but anger is not irrational when it's based on something that's true. No. And I would go further that I think anger can save you. Anger saved me. If you channel it, if you channel it, and use it to save yourself. I found the experience very paralyzing, very overwhelming. I, I mean, I felt my senses were flooded. I was physically sick from this knowledge. I was throwing up. I was, you know, I, I lost like 15 pounds in a week. I, my hair was falling out. My teeth. I mean, we can all talk about the stress illness of these discoveries. And it felt very, um, you know, I just want to go sleep forever kind of was a feeling. But anger got me up out of bed. Anger made me call a lawyer. Anger made me get a protection from abuse order. Anger made me fight back. Um, anger was my best friend during that horrific time. And I get when I get letters from people um, on the blog, I always worry about the sad ones. I always worry about the paralyzed ones and the ones who are snarky, the ones who are are spunky, who fight, who find a threat of ridiculousness in it all, I, I think, okay, they're going to be okay. You know, if I have to triage people as I'm going through letters, I, I think the one the ones who are sad and depressed and have turned it inward, they don't or who are terrified of being angry or called bitter. Let's discuss bitter next. Um, they have a much harder, longer path. Yeah. I agree. What I also find interesting is, is you know, you you talk about um, about friends there and and anger being your friend. But the other thing about that that I was advised to do is don't talk to anybody else about it. Don't say anything. And abusers rely on alienating you from your friends and family. But it almost seems there's a whole industry yeah. propping them up and saying, yeah, you alienate yourself. Don't tell your friends. Don't tell your family because if you do that, it's going to undermine your relationship and in and your or your marriage. And in doing so. So you're kind of propping up again their abusive behavior. Exactly. We are punished for telling the truth. Every and we know that doesn't matter what the truth is that we're telling. If particularly women, if we're telling it about a man, we're going to be punished for that. And and we know that played out in a patriarchal, misogynist society. That's the rule. And so you're going to pay for it. And I don't know whether they're trying to, it's, you know, people talk about this and there's lots of great books about it, but the need to silence us is really important. And furthermore, what happens to a lot of people when they do try to tell a friend or their spiritual leader or whoever, this is what's going on. Um, there's so much detail and immediately, you are cast into the angry woman mode 
or she don't she won't forgive or she gets the the tone policing everybody does it you know well you need to get over this and all that that stuff is really really harmful to uh continue to silence women and one one of the lines I, I learned to say very early on about my experience, and I want to share this as a tool, is I, I didn't say what my ex-husband did hmm. to people who asked. I would say uh, my husband developed a, a secret life of sexual and sexualized activities that began long before he ever married me and continued throughout my marriage. And it violated every value that was a part of me and our relationship in our vows. And if I had known, I never would have married him. Well, that the fact that I didn't say, oh, he, he's flirting or he's looking at porn or mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's having emotional affairs or sexual affairs, that was more horrifying to people mm -hmm. because they didn't know what to say to someone's secret life. And Omar, Dr. Mamuala has... He developed a whole program based on the secret basement, which is, which is about that. that yes, thing. we're going to interview him in October. Yeah. So yeah, no, I'm I'm interested. I think I think you're really onto something, and I have found that too when I discuss this work or the blog or whatever. If I put it in terms of a double life, of you know, and take it off the battlefield of sexual rejection, because again, they're like, oh, you're just mad. You know, you didn't win the pick me dance, you know, mm. poor you and go, no, you know, you were defrauded, you were deceived, you had these investments, you had these sunk costs, this person benefited from your investment in them. And that is why they kept up this, this double life. And I think, yes, I think people don't know how to respond to that. And I also think it's, um, Diane, I think you come across as even more terrifying. Being an angry woman is probably terrifying, but when you kind of share that vulnerability that like, I look like a rational person and I was completely hoodwinked by this person, um, that's a very scary thing. Yeah, it is. I love, the way, I love the way you change the narrative as well, because I think sometimes that when you say, oh, my husband had an affair or my wife had an affair, the implication is that they, they arrived to you perfect and somehow your behavior drove them to a fair I'll never forget my my ex-mother-in-law saying to me what did you do to drive my son to an affair and there's a uh, lot of that narrative but from what you what you say it makes it clear that they arrived in your life flawed and they went out of your life flawed and there was nothing that you did in between that made them the way that they are yeah and and had I been this is we we're disempowered by not having the information if we had the information about who they were we would have made different decisions, but we didn't have that chance. And that's that's why we get angry. Is well, let, let me stop you there, because if we had the information about who they were and we wouldn't have made that decision, some people have the information. Some people had big red flags or um, things that were shady, that were dodgy, whatever. And I would argue that the reason they go forward is because this abuse is so minimized, you know? Oh, you know, did he fuck a sex worker? Yeah, boys will be boys, whatever it is, you know, because we don't, not only do we not ask ourselves, is this acceptable to us, but we shame people for having boundaries around this kind of thing. You're not cool, you're not, you know, or we, we have all this, you said, softening of the language. Um, we're the, the therapy is very blurry about these lines. So how are we to impose them in our own life? Um, you know, I, I could genuinely say I would never have married, you know, my cheating ex if I had known what he was up to. But I also know from letters that I get that the people are in a lot of, um, it feels like a very fuzzy gray zone to them. And they feel these pressures that I have to be married. I have to keep my family together. I have to, you know, I have to do all these things or I'm, I'm, I'm a second class citizen because I am a single mother. I'm a single mother and I need a, a strong man in my life or another provider, whatever it is. There's so many messages that tell you try harder. You're nothing without a partner. Um, and, and I think those are equally toxic equally toxic so yes not only tell people you know to try to 
figure out who they are before you commit to them, but that you're really okay if you don't have a partner in your life, you know, be mighty first, be your own person before you look for someone. I, 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 I think a lot of why I wound up with a serial cheater and it's not like I knew, I didn't know, I don't have, you know, special powers, but I did get a lot of, I would have been a single mother for years. I had a little kid. I was doing it on my own. It was hard, you know, and, and you get love bombed and ooh, you know, that's, that's nice. <laughs> Yeah. someone unloads your dishwasher like woo you know like i'm living large here but if i'd had different messages i think there would might have been a different outcome i, th- I think it's interesting because i interviewed a, a a victim of the most horrific domestic abuse a couple of days ago and she she told me her story and she talked about how her friends had warned her against him how he was very violent and aggressive and she and i asked the question i said why did you keep going back and then as i was doing this i thought but I did, you know, when when my husband had an affair and I knew what, you know, I knew he was he was mentally abusing me, but I didn't see it in the same way that you see the the same narrative in in physical abuse. And I don't think you see it in in society either. I still think you see you see television programs where the affair partner is some glamorous, wonderful individual who recognize who who rescues their their affair partner from some horrible dull domestic drudgery where the woman's become a nag and a bit of a nuisance and and she almost deserves what she gets yeah yeah I think that all those points are are good I I like to think of it as a like a my electrical breaker panel and and there's a lot of factors involved in why our alarm systems get turned off why our critical thinking processes get turned off and and I like to think of that the process, and we we know that that physically abused women are take it's seven cracks before they ever really get out. So that's I think of that as seven breakers on the control panel, and it's like takes that long to get them all running again to understand when we say, wait a minute, this is the only life I get, and this is awful. And it, it takes a long process to get there. And it is all the influences, like you mentioned, Tracy. There, the whole the whole banquet of reasons why people feel that the relationship couldn't be that bad or won't be that bad or isn't that bad. Well, the truth of it is, is that no abuser is abusive all the time. I mean, they all got hooks. They all, you know... Yeah, there's some you weren't a total idiot for for marrying them or committing to them and then they usually do operatic remorse or they promise they're going to be different or you know they play on your absolute worst fears you know you want to be with those four children alone and no one will ever love you again and you know all the boogeymen they all get trotted out and the treatment industry uh, also doesn't recognize abuse. I, I don't know why they don't, but they don't. So they, they talk about having conflict. They don't know the difference between conflict and abuse. Say that, that again, louder for the people in the back, because that is such an important point. You know, conflict is about where you have a struggle or disagreement, different points of view about all kinds of things, including the resources that have power and ideas and, and all kinds of things. Abuse is when someone uses their resources or power to control or harm you. You cannot have a a marital reconciliation or treatment program with an abuser when the therapist is calling it conflict. Amen. And I am so excited that you are saying this stuff out loud. I thank you. Like well, that. it's it's one of the things that makes makes women more angry. And I'm remembering a, a friend who was in the same stew as I was in going to marriage therapy. And and they, uh, you know, she talked about, you know, his use of I think it was he was using hookers and all, you know, all kinds of stuff. And and uh, and it was then his turn to talk about what sh- what her offenses were. And the best he had was that she left her coffee cup on the patio for two days <laughs> oh my God. Uh, this is this is the crap that goes down 
and like the therapist industry. And, and I ha have had wonderful therapists in my life over, you know, my 67 years. So I'm not against therapy. It's, it's that it's like every other industry, including ministry. There are some people who are just not very good at all. And there are some that are superb. And there are some that are in the middle, but they're not going to hurt you. Well, and they, but, they're prone to cultural biases. They're, yes. they're prone to whatever the conventional wisdom is of the day. And it's absolutely, um, you know, pickled in the language and the therapy and the point of view that they have. I, you know, talk about... <laughs> the the conflict versus the abuse situation when I, I you know day within days of my first d day or second d day i went to marriage counseling with my cheater and picked someone on the health plan close to his office you know so it wouldn't inconvenience him terribly and and i wrote about it in the book i make fun of the bearded man in the sweater vest but you know he was all let me sit in a pose of non-judgment and and listen to you and I was 24 hours off of this man flying into a rage, telling me that he was going to hunt me down and burn down my house and kill me if I told anybody what he had done. And I told this therapist in the office. And he he paused. I mean, he didn't even like lift an eyebrow. <laughs> it's like, and he turns to my ex and he goes, and how does that make you feel? Yeah, no. And how does it make you feel? And, and I think he said, and Tracy, what do you want? And I, one of my demands was like, I want you to get an STD test. I mean, God knows where you've been. And he and he said, it makes me feel punished. And I, I was so in shock. And at the end, we all stand up, our 45 minutes are over. And he says, well, solemnly, like, this is a real nugget of wisdom. He goes, you two need to learn to dialogue. <laughs> okay, and now he has immortalized forever as a cartoon in my book <laughs> with his beard and but, his sweater but vest still, and his bad advice. The, the problem is, is since that happened to you, there are still people in, in sweaters and with beards and in various guises who are colluding with abusers effectively yeah. and justifying this behavior and trying to blame shift it onto the person who is the injured party. And if you had said that, Tracy, about to him, that you were going to do all those things to him, you would have been an angry and dangerous woman. Oh, that's right. Yes. I, that, I, I was an angry and dangerous woman, I guess. And I, I heard that happen in one of your previous podcasts when, when you... <laughs> You, I can't remember what exactly you were saying. I asked a hard question, Diane. That's a hard question. Okay. And, and, and the response was, well, you're angry as if, and, and, you know, that, of course, Sarah had to take, you know, that's the good cop, bad cop thing. <laughs> at that point. No, this, was, this was our, this was our special friend, Mr. Marshall, wasn't it? Who got across. <laughs> yes. And um, he was on the verge actually of, of, of disappearing and flouncing off. So we had to try and, that, try and, was, that was when, yeah. You by shaming you for sounding angry. And, and this is where we have to claim our mightiness to say, well, I'm only angry about things that are true and that violate basic justice. That's what I'm angry about. And well, the funny thing is, I wasn't even angry. I mean, well, I'm like, Andrew, you should see me when I'm angry, man. Yeah, I know, I know. You don't I, want I, to I be know. around, man. <laughs> but I was like, yeah. I, yeah. I just like put my journalist hat on. I'm just going to ask you a straight question. I know, but it doesn't matter. A, a critical thinking and, and a question that, that is going to be difficult. That's about a woman being angry. Anytime we're, we're going to want to talk about what's true and we have a point of view, that's trouble. So that, that is a part of that whole industry. And the fact that that um, I mean that that's in the sex addiction treatment industry. It it was just rife, and it's still there. Oh, she's angry. Oh, women's anger. Oh, when you tell them that, oh, oh, they go out of their minds, and as it as if they're the problem. Yeah. Well, so what do you, what do you tell your clients when people come to you and they're go, I'm angry, or I got called angry. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Do you have a script for them? You're like, yes, yeah. I am. Yes, I yeah. am. This is some fucked up shit, and I'm mad. 
Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of women who are, because mostly they come to me after they've spent, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in the industry. And so they wash up on my shore and they're full of rage. And, and I, you know, when, when it is apparent, I, I simply tell them, I take your anger as a sign of your sanity. You are recognizing something's wrong. And, and the thing about a, a woman being angry is, is that when, when you let them be angry and you say something like that, they, they don't have to be angry anymore. We have to continue to be angry because the truth of the experience is still being denied. That's what makes us so angry. And that's what where it gets suppressed. And we're and you know, Sandra Thomas in the nursing profession did all of this research. But what happens to us um, when we suppress our anger? And we get really, really sick. We our bodies become ill. We have mental health issues. But society's okay with women being sick or medicated because mm. they're not angry then. Anything but angry. Anything but angry. So it's a, it's about transforming that. And, and I understand that anger can go off the rails. I haven't met anybody yet where it's gone off the rails. Once they tell you what they're angry about, yeah, I'm angry about that too. Well, I think anger can be misdirected. I mean, we get, we get revenge occasional revenge scenario fantasy whatever or it gets directed at the affair partner which i think affair partners people should be angry at them but i wouldn't the the reconciliation industrial complex channels the anger at the affair partner i think and encourages the pick me dance like you know that that you know rake he seduced you or that you know wily woman with her feminine guiles you know took your man you better lock that down i mean there's a lot of misdirected anger um, a, a dispersal of your energies so that you don't advocate for yourself and you don't get out. Um, I would say that people are afraid of anger or chump anger because it upsets the power balance. And this is true for men or for women. If you call it what it is, abuse, and you see it for what it is, that this person is living a double life and harming you and risking your health, then you will topple the apple cart. You will take away all the goodies and all the entitlements. I mean, this is true in history. It's true in politics. It's true when you organize, you know, you get the vote, you get labor rights, you get, you get all the things that all the people who are enjoying the goodies don't want to share. Yeah. Um, and that, that's why they don't like your anger because it's effective, yeah. you know? Sad and as you say, anger, anger is a is a normal emotion when when you've had a lot of uh, bad things done to you. But the way it's it's used is is not in the way that you're the way that, that it's used sometimes is it's not implying you're angry. It's implying that you're unhinged for yes. having this reaction to to this level of abuse directed at you. It's it's implying it's 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 wrong and that your emotion is completely wrong when in fact it's entirely natural. Anybody would be angry. It's not just natural. It's rational. That's that's what we have to learn to say. It's that it is natural and it's rational to and be angry. I, I think rational is is such an important point. I, I remember when I went through it, and I would you know in these stupid therapy models, you try to have the conversation, you know, where they're supposed to answer your questions or whatever. The homework was, and um, I would ask a question, and much like Andrew G. Marshall, um, I got well. I can't answer that. I don't like your tone. When you can calm down and you can ask me in, in a more rational way that question, well, then maybe I'll consider answering, but you're too, you're too upset. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. a conversation stopper. Yes, it is. And it, it's how you silence people, silence anyone who has endured harm from you for, or from some larger entity or whatever but that's how you silence them and the silencing of the victim is very important to maintain the distribution of power to maintain the industry to maintain the income which is one of the reasons i would never go to any of these therapy things i thought you can i'm not paying you to do that to me 
But I understand how desperate people, I mean, I had a career. So I knew that, that I, you know, I'd be poor, but I, I, I could live. Other people are not in that situation. Mm-hmm. So I understand. And when we talk to women, often what we're doing is helping them plan. If they can't leave right away, we try to make a plan. But it's it's the denial that their anger has any reason, any ration, rational aspect to it. That is the disempowering piece and the silencing piece. It's proven. Can you talk a bit about how the therapy has shifted? You were saying at the beginning um, that they responded to your criticism and they softened their approach. But it sounds like the approach is still pretty awful and blame shifty, but maybe they just, they, they soft pedal it. Um, I think of Esther Perel becoming a trauma specialist was what came to mind with me. Oh, yeah, I know. I, you can't, um, you can't change people. You can only change yourself, but the industry, certainly there are some people who changed, but most of them don't have to because particularly in sex addiction, it's, it's an epidemic. They just, people will give them like how much money do I need to give you is is what the way it is and and it's also more difficult in that the therapists if you want to talk about codependency a lot of the therapists have a codependent relationship with the therapeutic model because they're sex addicts really yes the 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 in that industry is full of people who rehabilitated themselves and then became therapists supposedly all of this is sort of in quotes um but what that did allowed them when we had the codependency uh blame game on on the women that allowed them to implement it so they were in fact still abusing women did did they have to disclose i am a sex addict now therapist they don't oh really some of them do because some of them think that that's an advertising tool. As I look at I beat it. And, and, and certainly a lot of people did go to people like that because they thought this would be someone who under, and sometimes there's husband and wife teams, oh, but, Lord. but the point here is that there is no research that suggests there is any long-term recovery better than the, the spontaneous recovery of 5%, which is, you know, the true for most addictions. So they they have never in in the however forty or fifty years of their their modeling um, done one piece of publishable longitudinal resort uh, research to prove anything. Wow, that makes me angry, and I don't know why it doesn't make a lot of other people angry. Oh, you know, I that, completely agree. Yeah. So so that but but that's another place where if you raise it you know, they get really upset. They get angry because you're bringing it forward. Well, we can't, we can't ask people. Why not? That's how you do research in the field of psychology. That's how you do it to find out if what you're doing is right. So people are so desperate. They're so desperate that, that there just isn't enough pressure for that. So anger is important for clarifying things. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of decision making needs to be made with some kind of clarity and and putting the uh, breakers back on. Well, thank you. Can you tell us where people can read more of your work and, and find you? Sure. Uh, your story is safe here.com is my site. And there's uh, a gazillion blogs. Lots of them talk about anger. In fact, I did one pretty recently because um, it comes up a lot mm-hmm. and, and uh, there's one famous one, therapists and tone policing, which is on a reading list somewhere because it gets, it gets read constantly. And it's the one that I got two notes from two psychiatrists thanking me for writing it. Oh, because, wonderful. Okay. Well, okay. send me the link so I will put it in our show notes. Thanks for a chance to chat. You do Thank- great work. Thank you both for everything you're doing. So we have a new segment of Tell Me How You're Mighty, where we're introducing Buckwit of the Week. They're shameless, unreliable, and gobsmackingly entitled. 
It's Fuckwit of the Week. Okay, I believe this is for the Fuckwit of the Week portion of your podcast. Um, My twins had dinner with my ex-husband, their dad, a few weeks ago. And he and his schmoofy had just returned from a week in Mexico away from his kids. And he informed them that they were on a budget and they needed to split a meal. Uh, They are both 12 and growing. So they split the meal while he ordered three beers and then drove them home. Enjoy. Oh, that's a fuckwit. Well, Sarah, what do you think of our fuckwit of the week? The man who made his children share a single dinner. I I think these people are the gift that keeps on giving, aren't they? Just as you think that people can't sink any lower, they, they, they do. Just when you think they can't surprise us, they do. And I suspect that we'll be con- constantly um, receiving nominations for this this very prestigious award. <laughs> That's right. If you if you've got a fuckwit who wants to vie for the crown, <laughs> you know, send them to us at chumplady.com forward slash mighty. But the whole three beers for himself without any self awareness that he just told his children that he was broke. I mean, he's got a week to spend on vacation with his affair partner, but or schmoopy or whoever she is. Um, I mean, what a way to communicate to your children that he doesn't value them very much. I suppose that giving them a meal to share between them in his little brain, that was a very generous gesture that he made there, given his shortage of money. Yeah, that That's true. I'm sure it was a noble sacrifice to him. Wow. Well, as you said, they are the gift that keep on giving. So congratulations, Gretchen. You win, or I should say your horrible ex wins, fuckwit of the week. That wraps another episode of Tell Me How You're Mighty. You want to leave us a mighty story or a fuckwit of the week submission? Check out our new website, tellmehowyourmighty.com. That's your spelt Y-O-U-R-E. We've got all the episodes, show notes, links to our guests, and you can see the tea room where Sarah and I first met. If you enjoyed this episode, please review the podcast and follow us. Thanks. See you next week.